We're at the top of the hour, and let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest and a key topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, thinking about it is exactly what Professor Jonathan Zimmerman has been doing during a fantastic career. Uh, he has been giving us a whole way of looking into the history of higher education, education in general. And most recently, he's published a terrific book on the history of teaching and pedagogy in higher education called Amateur Hour. If you'd like to look at the book, the bottom left of the screen, you should see a, a yellowish, tannish colored button that just says the Amateur Hour. Click that, you can buy a copy of the book. It's terrific, it's important. And I'm bringing this poor fellow, this, this incredible scholar up here, because I'd like to ask him what we can learn about the history of teaching in higher education and what it tells us about the future of it. Welcome, Professor Zimmerman. Hi, Brian, thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Thank you, thank you very much. For and, and if I may, I also, I see in the crowd uh, that, that we also have Greg Britton who brought my book to Hopkins Press and I believe also yours. And uh, I think frankly has done more to uh, uh, expand and change the conversation on higher ed than anyone that I know. So special shout out to Greg. You're here. Greg is a wonderful editor, a wonderful publisher, and I agree. This line of books uh, is just producing a remarkable, remarkable body of work for uh, for higher education. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you. We're going to have to tease him about this in some way. I'm, I'm, yeah. We'll think of a way. Uh, we'll think of a way. Uh, Jonathan, and, and I, I'm manfully resisting making any Zimmerman telegraph jokes here, by the way. Just, just I know you get that a lot, but I'm going to hold back. Bob Dylan as well, yeah. Ah, there you go. But what it, I'm curious. When I ask people to introduce themselves, I ask them here, what they're going to be working on for the next year. So you're looking at the rest of fall semester and into spring and maybe summer 2021. What's uppermost in your mind? What are the big projects? Well, I just finished a small book uh, co-authored with Signe Wilkinson, the cartoonist on free speech called it's Free Speech, Why You Should Give a Damn. Whoa. Um, and uh, it's short by design and it's going to be illustrated by Signe, who, by the way, won a Pulitzer Prize for a cartoonist. Uh, wow. And, and so uh, I just put that to bed. And my big project, too big, and will take too long, is I'm going to write a history of schools and universities during pandemics. I just had to do that. Uh, that, that book doesn't exist yet. I know several people are working on it. Uh, and I'm going to do the best that I can. Wow. I, I mean, your best is, is the best. I really look forward to that. And, it's going to uh, take a while. Yeah. Oh, I, it. When when does your uh, when does your free speech book come out? It comes out in April, um, uh, April Fool's Day actually, and we're doing that by design because we thought it would work for a nice pitch. You know, like you might think this is a joke, but actually it isn't. And these are the reasons you should give a damn. Well, I I agree. I do give a damn, and I I'd, I'd love to I'd love to grab a copy. And I'd love to tell people about it when it comes out. So oh good okay. yeah or yeah you can just wait for the film adaptation yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I love comics. I love cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us, what, are you are you going to be teaching this year? Yeah, um, you know, I, I have your uh, standard teaching load at Research University, you know, two and two. And uh, I'm, I'm teaching two courses this semester as per the norm. And I'm one of the lucky ones. The courses are small. I always teach one undergrad and one grad course because I have this sort of dual existence as a professor in the ed school and in the history department. Mm. So I typically teach a, a graduate class in the education school and undergrad class in the history department, which is what I'm doing now. And they have 20 and 15 students respectively. So uh, I feel incredibly privileged because I think it's just a lot easier than many of my colleagues who are trying to teach large classes. Yeah, it must be. Well, enjoy. Uh, enjoy yeah. the classes. Uh, yeah. Friends, I have I have a whole battery of questions to inflict on on John, but I'm gonna hold. I, I want to ask just a couple to get things going. But the whole purpose of the future transform is for you to ask your questions. So we're thinking about the history of college teaching as well as the present and what the future of it would be. Think about what questions you'd like to ask, uh, and the whole platform is available for you. So again, just you know, reach in the bottom of the screen, either press that raised hand if you want to join us up here, or just you know, hit the question mark and type in a question or a comment. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, the first one I, I wanted to ask is a kind of, I guess, big picture question. Um, looking, looking at um, for higher education in the pandemic. Uh, 
what what lessons can we apply based on the history of college teaching for trying to grapple with how higher education and pedagogy could be changing? And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, what do we what can we apply from from your work to look ahead? Well, I guess I'd say a few things. I'd say that our moment is really different, which is a historical claim, right? If you say something's different, it's different from something that came before. And here's how. One of the stories that I tell in the book is that every time the institution expanded, it also adapted new machines, generally mm -hmm. as a way of distributing education more widely. Uh, so you see that in the wake of the GI Bill when suddenly the universities get huge. Uh, people don't realize this often, but in 1947, half of our students were vets. That's right. how dramatic the GI Bill was. Wow. And educational TV comes directly on the heels of that because there's this feeling that we're not going to be able to teach everybody the old way. There are too damn many of them. So we need a machine to expand it. Um, and, uh, you know, when we get into the 1960s with uh, so-called teaching machines or program learning, mm -hmm. similar thing, right? Um, you have a new era of growth, this time fueled by things like the Higher Education Act. Um, and a sense that we're not going to be able to do things the old way because there, there are these new faces. And what we need are new technologies that can help us bring in the new faces. I think what's really interesting about our moment right now is that everyone is on the machine. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we are right now. That's what makes it unique. So, mm -hmm. Brian, you know a hundred times more about this than I do. Um, uh, we didn't invent online education during the pandemic. It's been around for a very long time. Right. But you're much more likely to experience online education if you go to Delaware Community College mm -hmm. than if you go to the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and now everyone's got to do it. So there's a kind, there's a radically egalitarian dimension to this moment, which I do think is without precedent. But it's also going to raise, I think, hugely existential questions about not just education, but democracy. Because if people at Penn decide that online education isn't good or isn't good enough, yeah. as many of them have already suggested, then why exactly is it good enough for the students at Delaware Community College? And I think that's going to be something all of us are going to be confronted with. Thank you for that. That loom. I, I have a whole series of ways I want to follow that question with, and I can't because all the participants have just flung a whole stack of questions at you. They're much, much better. Th thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, we have a question from a historian, a fellow historian, uh, Phil Katz, who is at uh, the Council for Independent Colleges and asks, yeah. the history of college teaching separate from the larger history of teaching in America? Where do they diverge or intersect most strongly? Well, it's not separate. Nothing is. And I think that Phil's question is really important because I think one of the distortions that a lot of us, and I'm guilty of this too, impose on the past is we imagine there's K-12 education and then there's higher ed. And I even teach courses with those titles. And I probably shouldn't um, uh, because of all the overlaps. And I... I uh, I think there are several important, let's just say, uh, uh, cross mechanisms going on here. But I would say that the most important one, and in some ways the saddest one, is as follows. Because of the low status of K-12 through education, K-12 through teaching, and especially because the relatively low status of schools of ed, mm -hmm. which are charged with preparing teachers, mm -hmm. a lot of people in higher ed didn't want to engage educational questions straight on because they thought that was what the ed school does. And what the ed school does is down market. Mm -hmm. so throughout the book, when there's a call for reform, what I hear people in the colleges and the arts and sciences saying is, well, we can't do that because that will involve us with the ed school. And by the way, haven't you seen what they did to K through 12 education? It's not so hot. Um, so do we want that sort of regime being imposed upon us? And obviously there are huge non sequiturs in this argument, right? Um, not everything the ed school did was terrible, um, nor does it make any necessary sense that if the ed school does one thing with K through 12, it will do another in higher ed. But these status differentials matter. They matter hugely. And I should tell you that, I mean, it's a differential that I've experienced and confronted through my whole career precisely because I do straddle these two zones. So um, when I first got to NYU, where I taught for 20 years, I remember something in the history department saying to me, John, you, you do such good work. 
why are you in the ed school? Uh, uh, you know, uh, not knowing that perhaps this could be maybe a little insulting. It's like, John, you're Jewish and you're not cheap. You know, this is very odd. You know, I can I can leave my change around and you won't take it. Again, with no with like 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 with no cognizance that maybe yeah. you know. But 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 there was e e even in this this little insult, there was a certain sort of reality and even a certain sort of wisdom, which is that especially at a big research university, the school of that has always been the poor cousin. Um, and people don't want to engage in the subject and in the dialogue precisely because of that. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm just struck by that story about the, um, you know, sorry, that's that, uh, Phil, that, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and John, what a, what a wonderful, wonderful response. Um, uh, Lisa um, Hinchliff uh, has a question, and this is coming to you from the library world, and she has a question about your title. Uh -huh. so, so she asks, I admit my response is a bit negative to the frame, but I'd like to hear why it was chosen, reserving judgment. Uh, well, thank you, Lisa, for reserving judgment and also for the question. Um, uh, let me reassure you that you're not alone um, uh, in, in uh, uh, let's just say, uh, having a a puzzled or perhaps befuddled or occasionally offended reaction to the title. And here's why I chose it. Not because teaching is terrible or terrific, because with millions of people doing it, it's gonna be both those things and a million things in between. The reason I chose the title isn't because of the quality of teaching at the university, it's because of the status of it. And what I try to argue in the book is that that function has never been professionalized. And it has been professionalized because we haven't really developed a core of knowledge about what constitutes good practice, or at least not an agreement about that. Yeah. And we haven't created mechanisms to determine and evaluate whether we're abiding by those standards and practices, not in a consistent way. Um, so each of us are like doctors doing an, uh, an appendectomy, but just kind of doing it the way we think maybe it should be done. And then we talk to somebody else about how to do an ap appendectomy now and again, but there really isn't a consistent standard or even understanding of what good practice would be. And there definitely isn't a mechanism for seeing if we're abiding by it. Again, to, to emphasize to Lisa, it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, the greatest gymnast of my youth was Olga Korbut, and she was an amateur. That's because back then in the Olympics, you couldn't be paid, right? right? So it doesn't refer to quality, it refers to status. Does it, does it echo uh, the status of student athletes as amateurs? Well, um, you know, uh, it, it's an interesting analogy, and until I mentioned Olga Korbut, I hadn't really thought of it. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, I, I would say that you know, uh, um, uh, student student athletes in some ways um, have a very elaborate set of mechanisms to determine how good they are. Like in the case of track stars, you can actually time it. Um, what they don't have is uh, uh, the status and the remuneration mm -hmm. that we typically attach to professional skill. Although if you saw the New York Times just published a posthumous piece by John Thompson, the longtime uh, coach at the place Brian teaches Georgetown, saying we should we should pay college athletes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who make that case. Um, well, the, Lisa, I, I I'd love to hear your final judgment, um, and uh, and thank you for uh, a spot on question. Um, we have a whole series of questions that's popping up everywhere, and uh, a lot of them uh, are aimed at history. Um, so let me just try to bring up a few of them. This is one from the awesome Stephen Ehrman, uh, who, uh, who asks, uh, methodology question, what kinds of evidence can you use to glimpse how the mass of faculty teach in a particular discipline today or 50 years ago? Well, it's really hard. And I don't know how far into the weeds Stephen would like to go, but this is one of my favorite questions uh, because it's my passion, right? I'm a historian. Um, and uh, let me say a few things. Um, the fact that it is an amateur enterprise makes it really hard to study. Um, I've been at Penn now, this is my fifth year. I've never been observed in my classroom. Um, I have ironically had administrators come to my classes, but 
um, only uh, um, you know at, uh, to to discuss matters of the day with my students, not to evaluate me. Um, I was never, yeah, this is my fifth year. I was at NYU for twenty years, and I was observed my first year. That's it. Um, so this is actually this connects the last two questions uh, wow. in a way, right? Because one of the reasons it's so difficult to study is we don't have very much of a paper trail, and the reason we don't have a paper trail is it's not a professional enterprise. Um, not really. Um, so how do you, sorry, how do you get behind the classroom door? And what I did was I just went hunting for every memoir I could find. Um, I went hunting for all the student evaluations, which go back to the 1920s, by the way, student evaluations go back to the 1920s, student newspapers, and all the committees, because even though in some ways, teaching has remained fairly static, and I think, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, um, there's also been a goodly amount of discussion about it and a lot of efforts to reform it. And what that generated are the inevitable, uh, you know, committee reports and dialogues surrounding those. Um, now, all of these sources are imperfect and incomplete, like all sources are. And we could talk about student evaluations, of course, for a year. Um, they tell you some things and not other things. But one thing I will say apologetically is that because the book relies so much on archival sources, it definitely has a bias towards elite schools, like fancy private schools and kind of uh, big, well-known uh, yeah. flagship schools. Yeah. And the reason is those institutions have the wherewithal to preserve the most. So that's where I could get the most stuff. Um, there are exceptions to that. Um, for some random reason that I still don't know, Cal State Dominguez Hills has a terrific set of archives. Oh. Um, not, not, an, you know, not an elite school, a uh, fascinating school, but uh, oh. you know, uh, not certainly not a rich one. So there were some exceptions to that. Um, but there weren't enough of them. And that's definitely a bias and I think a weakness in the book. Well, it's a, it's an interesting weakness, but it doesn't sound like one that uh, can easily be, uh, be cured. Art, yeah. Um, unless, you know, we, that's always the thing with primary sources is the possibility of finding that one trove that's in the trunk. You know, that one's, uh, oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, have, uh, we have more questions uh, just piling in all over the place, and, uh, and this is great. And, uh, friends, if you'd like to uh, decloak, turn your camera on, and uh, appear on stage, that's easy as can be. Just click the raised hip. I just didn't even finish saying that, and someone clicked her hand. All right, just for that, Jen Obama, you get to come on stage. Uh, let's see if she's if she's ready or she hello jen hi how are you yes. um, i don't know why i'm not showing up not anymore. yeah i'm just getting your uh your audio right now um, oh there it is so i'm looking at my second screen um i hmm no, i'm still not seeing it but, but we can hear your voice so why don't you go ahead okay sorry well yeah so my question i was trying to formulate it in the in the chat and it was a little long so I'm an instructional designer and I'm, you know, in the area that I, that I'm in, I, there are several institutions that surround me and I'm seeing a really big struggle uh, with how to proceed with online education, designing online education. And you know, again, best practices, everybody wants to know best practices. And as you mentioned, you know, we just don't have that much evidence going back. Um, but what lessons from the past of, of higher ed education can you think, do you think we can take forward with us in conversations with administration and faculty to get them to implement strategies that there may be, you know, not a lot of research on, but it's, you know, showing great promise, things like engagement and, you know, sense of community. And they don't want to hear it. You know, they don't, they're, we don't have a school of ed. Um, a lot of people feel like it's just too touchy feely. It's not really, you know, research. And, you know, we're having these hard conversations. I'm having a hard time having these conversations because it's getting it's getting really hard for people to listen about the the right reasons or, or the right way to, in my opinion, to um, design future online courses. Well, you know, I think it's fascinating that um, the question of online has already come up in so many different contexts because in some ways it did spawn the book. Um, a story I tell at the very beginning is that I conceived of the book when I was at a debate about online instruction probably five, six years ago. It featured in bold terms the, uh, uh, the futurists against the Leadites. 
And the futurists said that online instruction was going to make everything better because it was going to democratize instruction and knowledge. And the Luddites said it was going to make everything worse because it was going to reinforce different kinds of inequities. Mm -hmm. and it was an interesting discussion. But when I walked away, I actually realized that the two sides, as it were, had much more in common than they recognized. Mm -hmm. What they had in common was they believed they knew what the baseline was, <laughs> right? If you're going to say that either everything is going to be better or everything's going to be worse, you must at least have some implicit understanding of what that everything is. Mm -hmm. and, and really, the reason I wrote the book at the most pedestrian level was just to try to figure that out, you know? Like, what has the baseline been? And, you know, to, to take the question more directly, like, what do, what, what do I think that, you know, this particular educator could possibly learn or apply from this book? I'd say a few things. I'd say, number one, the importance of the student voice mm -hmm. in reform and change. Um, this is a big theme of the book, because I would say if there was one thing that surprised me the most, it was how much organized activity there was across time by students to improve instruction. In fact, at one point in the 1920s, there's a conference in upstate New York State about college instruction, a student conference, mm. where students, representatives, delegates from over 50 different institutions gather. And they invited, of all people, James Harvey Robinson, who was the historian at Columbia, and by the way, a vociferous critic of how bad college teaching was, to give like the keynote. Mm -hmm. This is a student organized conference about basically how shitty college teaching is. <laughs> and this is in the 1920s when suddenly the university got extremely big, um, basically because uh, two reasons. It was a time of relative affluence and more women were going. And at University of Michigan, which is one of the places where uh, uh, student evaluations were born, again, in the 20s, people start writing these emails like, you know, I went to this course. The room was supposed to fit 100. There were 400 people there. They were sitting outside and in the hall. There was one guy up there with a mic that didn't work, and he was mumbling, why am I in Ann Arbor? Um, and, and, you know, these complaints had effects and often good effects, and they forced institutions to change. Um, so if you look in the 1920s, you have the introduction of precepts and tutors, you have honors programs, um, uh, uh, you have uh, comprehensive exams, um, uh, you have other kinds of kind of small group instructional, as they were called back then, experiments, very much spawned by this protest. And you know, I, I won't belabor the details, but you can say, see a similar dynamic in the 50s with the GIs. The GIs were tough customers. Okay. Like they come back, like, and if somebody's not doing the job, they let you know. Like these are not 18-year-old kids. Like they they fought like a Guadalcanal. You know, they're, they're not going to listen to this joker just like jaw on. Um, and, and that was really important. And then in the 60s, like we forget that, you know, the student movement, as it were, wasn't just targeted at Vietnam, you know, and at, uh, you know, civil rights slash racism. Although, of course, those were motivators and targets. It was also targeted at poor teaching. Um, you look at the, the you look at the paradigmatic or the first paradigmatic student protest document, the Port Huron Statement. Um, you'll find at least three junctures in the Port Huron Statement where they, i.e. Tom Hayden, who wrote it, say, and by the way, we're in these huge impersonal classes where we're not learning very much, and our professors seem to only care about their research, and they make mm -hmm. things incredibly impersonal. That's in the Port Huron Statement. So I would say the first thing to remember is just how influential students have been in this story. Um, and I guess the second thing that I would say is when teaching has improved, part of it is because students have demanded it. But I think at other times, different parties, different faculty and administrative parties have successfully persuaded their colleagues that this is an intellectual enterprise. So I hear what the questioner was saying about the prejudice here. And again, like I was saying earlier, I've, I've experienced it directly. Oh, this is so touchy-feely. You know, uh, this is sort of emotional and kind of intuitive, but boring. Um, it turns out that like how to teach algebra well is a hugely complicated question. Um, uh, the problem is in our culture, we often don't regard it as such. Um, and, you know, I wrote an essay in the New York Review of Books a couple of years ago about this, where they gave it a terrible headline. It was called, Why is Teaching So Bad? 
which is a ridiculous title, because what does it even mean, right, with millions of people doing it? My title, which of course they didn't use, is Why Aren't Teachers Intellectuals? Um, not that I don't think they are, but right. in culture, they're not regarded as such. Hmm. And I would say the most successful changes have happened when reformers have framed these things as intellectual questions, which, by the way, they are. Sure. You know, how to teach any discipline well is an incredibly complex intellectual question. And I think if you want to engage intellectuals, that's what you need to do. Well said. Um, thank you. Thank you for the very, very deep question. And, and please, good luck with your work at Stevens. Please say hi to my friends there too. Um, and John, thank you for that for that great question. Um, plunging back in time, I, I love this idea of students holding a conference on the. Yeah. yeah. We we have a, a, a few more historical uh, questions that I want to bring up since we're in that mood, uh, and this is one from the splendid Kate Borowski uh, at Southwest Minnesota. And uh, Kate says she's curious. Uh, she went to high school in the and college in the seventies. How would you compare the big changes then and the ones appearing to take place now? Oh boy. Um, well, uh, um, uh, here's what I would say about the the big changes in the sixties and seventies. Um, uh, a lot of them were about experimentation. This thing called innovation, and there was a great deal of it. Uh, it took a whole variety of forms um, uh, on small scale. Uh, there were kind of encounter groups and tea groups and psychotherapy inspired small group activities. But there were also kind of much bigger, larger, um, in some ways, as I was saying earlier, more impersonal reforms like so-called teaching machines uh, and program learning, which we associate with figures like B.F. Skinner, who's an important figure in my book. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that actually there was probably more flux and definitely more controversy about pedagogy itself. You know, what I haven't seen in this moment yet is that. There's a lot of discussion, but to cut back to the earlier questions, I haven't seen a huge amount of student protests around these questions. I suppose you could call some of the demands for tuition reduction mm -hmm. a version mm -hmm. of that. Yes. You know, um, but that strikes me as a much more specific and targeted thing. You know, um, uh, that is obviously um, uh, the implication there, the assumption is it's not as good. But I haven't seen a huge amount of student effort to try to document and establish and promote that idea, whether it's right or wrong. I think we could see that. Um, you know, I study dead people, so I don't, unlike Brian, who's a futurist, I don't know anything about the future. Um, uh, but, you know, I would say that the, the, um, the overlap would be that in both cases, like to go back to Robert Zimmerman, we, we know something is happening and we don't know what it is, um, nice. you know, uh, you know, Mr. or Ms. Jones, right. um, that there's clearly a sense that we're, we're at some sort of precipice. Um, unlike the 60s and 70s, it was in some ways imposed upon us by the pandemic. Right, and the pandemic is, in that sense, sui generis. Uh, as I'll show in my next book, we've had pandemics before, but not pandemics that forced all of us to go onto our laptops, which is I, which is where I am now. Uh, and I think we're just too close to that revolution to to get a purchase on it. Well, we'll see. We'll see how we can do. We're still the journalists are still of it right now. Exactly. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate, for the really nice question. Uh, Sarah San Gregorio has a question that takes us a little further forward in history. Uh, and she takes us to 1983. Uh, and Sarah asks us about the uh, fallout of the book, A Nation at Risk, on that report. How can we start to use professionalization to address systematic issues due to the commodifying of higher education? Well, see, this is really interesting. Yeah. You know? Um, and there are many dimensions to Sarah's excellent question. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Nation at Risk. That, that, that the mini history of it is to me fascinating uh, because Jimmy Carter was the first president who established the Department of Education. Most people don't realize that. And Reagan was elected in 1980 on the platform of eliminating it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he felt that it was extraneous, that this was essentially a state and local enterprise and not a federal one. But T.H. Bell, who wrote Nation at Risk, essentially pulled the rug out under from Reagan. Um, uh, he was this person, this professor from Utah, nobody knew very much about him. And it was thought that he was going to be kind of a placeholder until the department went away. But Bell wrote uh, an essay, this is really what it is, um, arguing that our nation was at risk, especially at economic risk, because we weren't actually preparing the workforce to compete with, at that time, the fear was Japan, now it would be China. And, and it was actually so effective uh, and resonated so deeply that it eliminated the effort to get rid of the Department of Ed. And Reagan apparently was pissed. Uh, mm -hmm because he did want to get rid of it, but once the nation at risk happened, he couldn't, uh, because again, there was so much discussion around it. And look, you know, the nation at risk, a lot of people have taken it to task for appropriate reasons, especially for the way that it imagined um, young people only as future workers, not necessarily as citizens, and the highly economistic way it framed its appeal. But at the same time, it did galvanize attention around the issue. And I would say to Sarah that we are awaiting our nation at risk moment mm. in higher ed instruction. Mm. Um, uh, obviously for people who care, there's a lot of awareness about not how bad it is, but how uneven it is. That's the adjective I keep coming back to, radically uneven. Um, uh, uh, there is an awareness of that, but there hasn't been a single galvanizing document or report or moment um, that really focuses us on uh, the weaknesses of, of, of this instruction and its unevenness. And, and uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to have one. About 20 years ago, I thought um, the uh, National Academy's book, uh, How We Learn, might have done that. Yeah, yeah. And then there was the Boyer Report. You know, Ernest Boyer did this thing about, you know, college teaching in the 90s. And it isn't that we haven't tried, you know, there's been a whole lot of talk, that's for sure, you know, but there hasn't been anything that really resonated like Nation at Risk. And look, that the Nation at Risk moment, it might come about college costs rather than college instruction. Uh, you know, yes. Um, I, I just yeah. reviewed for the New York Review a series of books about the, you know, the cost crisis. Um, and uh, you know, that might end up being what really gets people to sit up and take notice. Um, that is the price rather than the quality. I do think they're related, but sometimes you, know, you get more attention by looking at the price. Especially during a recession. Um, uh, friends, your, your questions are coming in and they're great. Um, and the, uh, the questions are now shifting towards uh, the present um, in this crisis moment. And, and pointing in the future. I just want to have a quick shout out. You mentioned uh, Teaching Machines twice and B.F. Skinner. I just want to have a shout out to our very, very first guest back in 2016, uh, Audrey Waters, who has a yeah. Who's the expert uh, on book yeah. on this very subject now. Um, yeah. So uh, one question comes from um, a gentleman who can't be here right now. I want to ask so, uh, Tobin. And you two had an exchange. You tangled with each other in the pages of the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, I like I like what he wrote. Yeah, this is this is back in March, and and, yeah. and you said that uh, we should be uh, analyzing the uh, shift online that was happening in spring. And yeah. Tom said, "No, absolutely not. Uh, you can't do that because it's emergency learning." And I'm just wondering, six months now? I mean, it's a it's a long time. Uh, seven months. Um, yeah. What? Uh, uh, what do you think now about uh, analyzing this, this this experience that we're in the middle of right now? I, think I, you know, I took Tom's point and I thought it was a really good point. And I did try to nod to it in my own piece, but I probably didn't underscore it enough. That was an emergency. And you don't render or you shouldn't render a global judgment based on people's response in an emergency. Um, but I still think you can learn stuff. And I think that's sort of the gospel of scholars everywhere. Right. Um, I think I take Tom's point that perhaps I exaggerated what we could learn from that, but it was still something like we could learn how people respond in an emergency. Right. And that's important because there will be other ones. Right. That we can't forecast, um, you know, to cut to your question, Brian. I mean, it, it's interesting. You know, 
Um, how, what difference does six months make? I think that's an open question. And because the system is so incredibly diverse and variegated, I think the answers to that are going to radically differ depending on where you are on the system. Um, you know, there's no question that a lot of us, myself included, spent a big part of the summer working on online adaptations and we weren't expecting to do that, you know. Um, but unlike Tom, most of us, including me, had never taught online until the emergency. Um, and so, you know, it's worth asking, well, you know, is this part of the same emergency? Is this still, uh, you know, a study of an emergency and not a test case about the medium itself? And I think that's an interesting question. I don't okay. really know the answer. Well, thank you. That's, that's a very, very generous and kind answer um, to, the, uh, to the question. Um, and Tom, thank you, for, uh, thank you for raising that. I'm glad to see this continue this uh, exchange. Yeah. We have another question from another gentleman named Tom, who is also brilliant um, and also a friend of the program. Uh, Tom Haynes, uh, who asks a related question. Uh, how much of the criticism of online or remote learning stems from the illumination of bad teaching techniques? Mm, that's interesting. And you can interpret this question in a bunch of different ways, you know. Um, uh, I would say that, frankly, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that we're having this very discussion. You know, I think that, um, you know, for me, the big question always now, ever since the digital revolution, is why do we have to be in the same room? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, Brian, you and I and the other people on this call are not in the same room. Um, and we seem to be having an interesting discussion, you know, and I've certainly learned something from it. Um, when and why do you have to be in the same room? Um, to me, that is the question. Uh, my favorite song in Hamilton is The Room Where It Happens. And this is very dweeby because now whenever I hear that song, I think of this question. Like, what is the room where it happens? What happens in that room in the physical space? How is it different from a chat room? Um, I, I, the other way of thinking about the question is, well, is the real problem is it's just shown us that a lot of online instructors like Zimmerman, who had never been an online instructor, just aren't that good because they've never done it. Yeah. And that's also a very reasonable question. I mean, I would argue to go back to what I said at the very beginning, that because my classes are so small, I think the gap between what I do now and what I did in the physical space is probably less. There's still a gap. And again, I, I'm not necessarily the best judge. This is one man talking and a highly subjective man at that. Um, but uh, I would expect that if I taught a class of 80 now online, that the gap between what I was doing as an 80 person instructor online vis-a-vis face-to-face would be much larger than the gap I'm facing now. I do feel a gap, but I don't think it's as big as it would be if my classes were bigger. Understood, understood. Thank you, thank you for the deep question. We can always count on times, and, and thank you for, for engaging with them. There are two quick comments, just, uh, just wanna share from the chat. One of them, uh, Zach Schenk win the phrase of the day award for the Zoom where it happens. And uh, uh, John Higgins freeze, uh, says that one of the reminds us that one of the benefits of higher education is uh, a sort of mating uh, that college grads tend to marry and to marry each other. Um, but we also have um, let's see a, a video con a video comment coming from uh, Ryan Craig, uh, who uh, has a question to go back to the question of student evaluations, um, mm. how they play out. And in full, I have to confess. Uh, in one of my classes, Ryan was a student and uh, wrote uh, some very fascinating research on student evaluations. He's also an anatomy and physiology instructor. Um, so you know, we have to bear this in mind. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Brian. Your, your introductions are always so fascinating on how you're going to flatter us. Uh, <laughs> Professor Zimmerman, fantastic to meet you virtually. Me too. Thank you. So... Uh, it was fascinating to hear you talk a little bit about the student reports of instruction, or we can call them uh, the uh, end of course evaluations, the student evaluations, whatever you want, want to call them. Uh, one question that I have for you is, first off, 
In what ways do you use those reports that you get from the instruction, those evaluations, those polls for your own coaching? How do you break them down? How do you analyze them? How do you take those interesting uh, bits of information and improve your own teaching? Well, um, here, of course, the expert is yet another author published by Greg Britton, Scott Gelber, who wrote a whole book about the history of these evaluations. But um, to, to answer the question here, I think that what I learned researching the book is that they can tell you a lot, um, uh, but there are things they can't tell you. Um, so what can they tell you that really matters? They can tell you things like, does the teacher return work in a timely fashion? Which turns out to be extremely important for people's learning. And you can only really glean by asking the students. Does the teacher make herself or himself readily available outside of class? Also very important. Also something you can only get from the students. Um, and those things really matter. So I take those things seriously. But, and here's the huge but, how much did you learn from this class? It turns out that all of us are very poor judges of that. Um, and when we've actually tried to see if there's any relationship between people's perception of what they learned and what they actually learned as best we can determine it, it's very tenuous. You know, tenuous doesn't mean absent, it just means tenuous, you know? So I'm a big believer in student evaluations, but I'm also a believer that they shouldn't be the sole measure. You know, and I think that unfortunately that debate like so many others has just been ridiculously polarized. Like you're for student evaluations, you're against them. And that's just dumb, you know? Like, like I, it, that's like saying to me, like, do you like weather? You know, it's like, I like good weather. I don't like bad weather very much. Um, so we should absolutely survey our students. We should listen very carefully to what they say, but we should also acknowledge that there are important things they can't tell us that we need other mechanisms for measure. And I think that's spot on everything that you're saying. I think uh, this room uh, virtually that Brian has filled up here is the choir here in many different ways to what you're saying. So how do we deal with those administrators and those promotion and tenure committees that look at those student reports as the end all be all of how you're doing as an instructor? And, and how do we start to change that culture at the higher ed level across the board? Yeah, well, you know, I think in some ways it cuts back to what I was saying earlier about about embracing all this as intellectual activity, right? So if we really did that, we would have cultures of peer review that were in some ways disciplinary specific. Um, I have to tell you that I don't think I could go into your classroom if you were a physicist and render a really sound judgment of your instruction. I, I could pick up on some things and I would still like to go, by the way, I think I could learn something. But I wouldn't want my evaluation to be determinative in any way. And the reason is I don't know enough about physics. Um, uh, but I do want other physicists doing that. And ultimately, that's going to be the only solvent here, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know how to make this happen. But I do know that the only way to reduce an overdependence on student evaluations is to have a different kind to have a peer-driven kind, right? There's your answer. But there's also across time been a huge amount of resistance to that. And that's another thing the book documents. Often, and this was very painful for me to read about, in the idiom of academic freedom, this by the way drives me insane. Hmm. And the reason it drives me insane is I am a zealot about academic freedom. I always have been. In some ways my next book is about it. But what I understand academic freedom to mean is that we all must be free to pursue our ideas and our research without uh, the state or anybody else telling us what we can and can't learn or know or say. And that's absolutely integral to the production of knowledge. But academic freedom doesn't mean that I can just do whatever the hell I want in my classroom, right? Um, uh, but you find across time a lot of people saying, now, I don't want you observing me in the class because that's going to inhibit my academic freedom. It's like, how? Like, how is that going to inhibit, like, your production of knowledge, you know, or your contribution to these dialogues? It isn't. Um, that's a balderization and I think a radical misrepresentation of what academic freedom is or should be. But it's a major theme in the book. 
I'm glad it is. And um, and uh, Ryan, I'm delighted for your question. And, yeah, no, thanks so much. It's a uh, fascinating perspective that you bring, and hope it's more people in the administration following this line of thinking. Yeah, you're here. Thanks for that. Uh, we try to uh, bring the end of the forum uh, towards thinking about uh, more of the future, and we've touched on that a little bit. But I wanted to bring up some questions that uh, folks have had that really are very direct on this. So this is one from uh, Shinli Wong, University of Manitoba. Shinli, if I mispronounced your name, my apologies. I'm, I'm working on the on Chinese pronunciation. What's going to happen to the precarious labor situation in higher education? And I think uh, in Manitoba, they'd be called sessionals, and of course here in the US, uh, adjuncts, um, a proportion that grows uh, ever larger. This is a huge question, and it's deeply connected to the question of professionalization, right? I mean, the, the sad fact right now in the United States, and because I'm American, you know, I'm pretty ignorant about Canada, with apologies. Uh, but, um, you know, we've got about a million and a half professors, and only a half million of them are tenure or tenure track. So the majority of our faculty um, are contingent or adjunct faculty. And um, uh, obviously, I can't speak to the future. Um, but what I can say, and this comes up near the end of the book, is that, you know, we're not going to be able to actually professionalize teaching in the ways I'm describing if we're simultaneously starving teachers. Like, that just doesn't compute. Um, and look, not all adjuncts are getting starved, right? And I think you know, that's important to point out too, right? If you're a law school and you hire a lawyer from a firm downtown because she's an expert on whatever product liability, yeah. and uh, that's great, you know? And But the point is she's got a day job and also a well-remunerated one, right? What I'm talking about are the so-called freeway flyers, uh -huh. uh, which I was one at one point, you know, yeah. you're trying to string together four different classes without health insurance. Um, lo and behold, when we study those people, we find out that they don't spend as much time talking to students and they don't spend as much time evaluating student work. You know why not? Because they're on the highway. Like, I wouldn't either if I were them. Yeah. Um, so, so, so thank you for the question. And, you know, this is going to be a really hard one for all of us. You know, um, uh, uh, you know what kind of profession do we want to be? I think that what the question points us to, at least in the American context, the United States context, sorry, is a kind of dystopic idea where you have a small number of people who are researchers who actually have health insurance, and then a huge sort of academic lump and proletariat of people that teach. And I don't know how to professionalize the teaching function, but that ain't going to do it, right? That will have the opposite effect. Thank, thank you for that for that vision. Uh, Michael Meeks, uh, professor at Louisiana State, had a question about that. And I think you just uh, kind of uh, walked into an answer for that. But I want to, um, and thank you, Shinli, I want to uh, bring up a related question to this that comes up from uh, Joe Supernaw, uh, who asks about lifelong learning. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, the shift towards, I believe she's referring towards greater professionalization, uh, towards the shifting of the future for lifelong learning? Well, look, I mean, uh, um, I think Joe's question is incredibly important, and we have to remind ourselves always that in the United States, roughly half the students go to community college. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the community college students, I think I, I read recently that a third of them are 25 or older. Um, you know, uh, uh, because I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, a very expensive, a very elite, a very traditional in some ways school, one of the big messages I always have to give to my students is get out more. You know, like your experience is not the modal one, nor was mine. So think about this. Like I went to college when I was 18. I majored in a liberal art. I was residential, i.e. I lived at the college and I completed in four years. Okay. And I thought that was the norm. It isn't. All right. And now it really isn't. In fact, all of those experiences, every single one that I just alluded to are minority experiences. Like I am the minority. Um, the biggest major in the United States is business. The second biggest major is the allied health sciences. Um, most people take six years to complete. They don't go when they're 18. Um, I, I, the community colleges, almost none of them are residential. So, you know, I think Joe's question is just a, another reminder to all of us that we need to get out more. And 
I mean, God, where to start? I mean, there's so many dimensions of this. I mean, one of the reasons the community colleges were in many ways uh, leaders in the online space, and Brian will know much more about this than me, is precisely because their students were in the, you know, what we now, I don't like this term, but non-traditional category, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, uh, much less leeway, many more constraints, both occupationally and family-wise. Um, uh, and so, you know, if we think about um, lifelong learning as more and more people of different age groups um, uh, uh, engaging themselves in formal education, uh, obviously, you know, the technology piece is a huge part of that. Uh, but again, again, my concern is this, you know, if we do decide that there's a room where it has to happen and it's not the Zoom room, I don't want those people getting the short end of the stick, right? Um, and that's a big if, right? Because again, we're so close to this revolution, we're still figuring it out. But if there is something, something irreplaceable that happens in the room, the physical room where it happens, yeah. I want all of our students and all of our future citizens to have access to that, uh, not just mine. That is a fantastic statement. And uh, also I have to say a, a ringing way to conclude our session today, uh, because we are right at the top of the hour. And, and we, with all due regret, I, I have to wrap things up. Um, yeah. Professor Zimmerman, you've been a fantastic guest. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. And thanks for the great questions and also the way that you mediated them. It's not easy, but you did a terrific job. So yeah. I, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the forum community is uh, beautiful. Beautiful one. One one question is, uh, you mentioned uh, obviously we need to be in touch with your brain. We need to follow up with your thoughts. Uh, we have a link to uh, the Amateur Hour here, uh, but also how can we uh, follow your work in, in general? What's the best way? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I, I I don't do social media, and that's a whole other conversation. So you know, I do write a newspaper column every week, uh, and if you're interested in my work, if you just make a Google alert about me, you will see it. Sounds good. Uh, uh, you know, and that seems to be the reason I don't use social media is just because it would be too distracting for me. You know, I, I know myself well enough uh, and I feel so distracted already. It's not because of any sort of global objection to it. It's just because of, uh, you know, how I learn. As an individual, right? That's, that's, how, that's how things go. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you again. Uh, I'm really looking forward to bringing you back. Um, I'm delighted. Yeah, yeah, and, and I look forward to participating in other of these discussions. Well, thank you. Good, good luck with your next two books. All right, thank you. Take care. But don't go away, friends. Um, first, accept a, a huge uh, compliment uh, from Professor Zimmerman about your questions. Uh, you guys are that good. Your questions are that rich. Thank you. Thank you all. Let me just mention a couple of things about the next few weeks. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to uh, join our poll, or we're asking about uh, you know, our schedule in December, as well as about uh, 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 adding another social media platform, as well as a couple of things about guests, go to this quick poll. Just go to surveymonkey.com slash r slash FTF 2020 and fill some things out. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these questions, about the history of teaching and about evaluations and about uh, the, the Zoom where it happens, uh, we have lots of room for this conversation to occur on, uh, on social media. So just to use, uh, uh, Twitter is usually the most popular one, just, just use the hashtag FTTE. Um, remember our topics for the next few months are just manifold, uh, covering a whole range of topics, so make sure we get to see you there. Uh, if you'd like to dive back into the past, looking at our previous programs, which touch on pedagogy and social justice and quite a few topics related to this, please just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive right there on YouTube. Um, and uh, above all, um, it's been great talking with all of you and thinking with all of you. Please uh, take care of yourselves. Stay safe during this outrageous time. And uh, we'll see you online next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.